and this is a year-long project that I'm working on with a client, and we needed to shoot video around four seasons, fall, winter, spring, summer, of how this trail was going to look. And the one cinematographer that was hired was Nick Lang. And that's how I met Nick Lang, and he is here today to speak with us about drone filmmaking. So a little bit about Nick. Nick is a producer, director, photography, aerial cinematographer, editor, motion graphics designer, and colorist based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His aerial work has been featured on PBS commercials in Philadelphia and New Jersey on multiple, and multiple aerial showcase websites. Recently, his aerial reel placed first during the Connecticut Drones International Drone Day Film Festival contest. His aerial reel was also selected as a finalist for the Inter-Drone Film Festival. And when Nick is not flying, he can be found teaching new pilots how to fly and speaking on panels as an aerial cinematographer expert. He flies a DJI Inspire 1 and a Phantom 2, is sponsored by FPV Pilot with Rage Cams. And please welcome Nick Lang to RCVC. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brooke, for that. Um, yeah, so I'm Nick Lang, uh, just an aerial cinematographer. I've been doing uh, directing, uh, DP work, editing work for about eight years. And just recently, probably about two years ago, is when these drones became regular. Uh, you were able to buy these drones on Amazon. Uh, now you can buy them in Best Buy. Um, so that's when I kind of picked it up. I was working at an ad agency uh, when I saw my first drone video. It was just uh, a simple shot. It was um, kind of like on those spillways where there was a guy being pulled by on a wakeboard. And the shots they were getting, I was, I was like watching it, not knowing it was a drone video. I'm like, okay, it's a jib. Oh wait, that's not a jib. There's no way it's a jib. What, what, oh, it's probably a cable rig system. But then some of the maneuvers they were doing, spinning around, I, I, I had to look into it and found out it was a drone. Uh, it was the first time I even knew that these things existed. Uh, I went to my boss, I was like, dude, you gotta check this out. Like, we gotta get one of these things. At the time, they were about $20,000 to get what you need to get. So, you know, our, our clientele wasn't ready for a $20,000. You know, we, we couldn't bill our clients. Uh, that just 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 saying hey I know we're shooting for you already can we throw in this additive drone oh by the way it's gonna be five thousand dollars they you, you know it's, it's kind of hard to do that in the middle of a project um, but then um, I left that company for a show in PBS called Articulate with Jim Cotter in Philadelphia uh, and the show producer said look this is our first season we've got to make this show you know something that PBS isn't used to something more um, in a stylistic way and um, you know bring all your you know creativity to the table and I said, uh, I don't have one, but we should get some. We should, we should get a drone. We should do some aerial cinematography. And at that time, he actually said, you know what? I have a drone. And I was just like, what, 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 you, you have a drone? Like, like, I've been working it for three months, and I'm just now finding out you have a drone. He's like, yeah, I can't fly the thing. I bought it. It just sits in my closet. So it was actually Phantom One. Uh, this is this is the uh, the Phantom Two. Uh, but the Phantom 1 is very similar. Uh, the Phantom 1 that we had didn't even have this gimbal at first. Uh, you put a GoPro in here, uh, and then you see what the drone sees on an FPV system, like a monitor. Uh, but this is, this is pretty much the standard one, uh, the Phantom 2. They now have the Phantom 4, but they all kind of look like this. And I'll get into more details of what drones are out there. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of a background of how I started. Um, so then um, I was doing all the drone work for the show, and I thought, you know what, I kind of want to just do this on my own. I kind of want to just do drones full time because I was also shooting for them, editing for them, producing for them. And I said, you know, let's, let's do it. Let's, I, I got all the stuff I needed, started marketing myself to the professionals I already knew in the area, uh, built a website, built a reel, um, and that's kind of where I am today. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is kind of my, my main gig right now. I still do shooting and editing, uh, especially in the winter because you can't fly these drones uh, in certain conditions, like if it's raining or if it's snowing. And not just because of the technical aspect, but it, it, you, you as filmmakers know that if you get something on your lens and you don't find out till post, it's like, what, what, did I, what did I shoot for? And that happens a lot if you're shooting in, obviously, conditions that you can't tell that there's a little speck of water on there and you can't use a shot. Uh, so yeah, it's just a little background about myself. So um, usually when I talk, when I give speeches, I kind of give an overview of everything that would include some of the, some of the topics that Brooke mentioned, like agriculture, the FAA, um, search and rescue things. I'm going to kind of just focus today on filmmaking in general because I know you guys are filmmakers students yourself. Um, so I just want to kind of just talk about you know how I use these in a real life situation, show some clips, and you know open for Q and A after that. So I do a lot of education, and the first thing people are asking is what buy, what drone should I buy? And really, you got to start with the simplest drones out there. Uh, I, I personally started out with 
this guy right here. I mean, this is this is hand. This is hand. Uh, so, uh, oops. You know, fit, fits in the palm of my hand, and this has no GPS or anything like that. I'll get into the technical stuff of all these drones soon, but uh, I'll just show you some how this kind of works. And this is great for uh, indoor flying as well. So you know, it's just kind of technically not supposed to fly over too many people, but <laughs> I think. I think if this goes down, we'll be all right. Uh, so yeah, this is how I started. I mean, it's got all the controls as your normal drone. You can yaw, move back, right, left. Uh, and there would be times where I would just be sitting in my house and just trying to get the thumb control. So let's say I'll try to put the front of the drone on that TV screen and kind of move around. You know, I would do that for hours um, until I even, until I invested in you know, a more expensive drone. Um, I say that because, you know, like Brooke mentioned as well, I mean, this holiday season especially, people were buying Phantom 3s like, like it was nothing because the price is just so affordable now. This Phantom 2 that I got, when it first came out with all the additional features, I have an updated controller, FPV system built in, bigger motors. Uh, we paid about $4,000 for that. Uh, now you can buy a Phantom 4, which has obstacle avoidance, tracking, um, all kinds of stuff for only $1,399. So, and that was literally... They, they released the Phantom 2, what, like two years ago. Last year was a Phantom 3, this year is a Phantom 4. So it's really just going to get more affordable and easier to fly. Um, but still, I always stress the importance of flying, teaching yourself how to fly, first of all, or going to someone like myself, getting lessons. Um, because, you know, this, this bird right here, like if this goes down, I have to tell my clients, you know, I'm out for, you know, how long it takes me to get another one or repair it. Uh, luckily, knock on wood, that has not happened. Uh, but, you know, it's all because... I spend so much time making sure that I'm safe on location. I know, you know what's, what's going to be going on with the weather, uh, how close I am to airports. All that stuff you have to take into consideration while we'll getting into. The other thing is a flight simulator. I brought just the controller of the flight simulator, but you can buy these on eBay um, for about $40 and get a software that literally it's called Real Flight Drone. So it has some different models of drones. You sit at your computer and it's the same kind of physics as you would be flying a real drone. Um, and that's literally when I, when I teach, you know, people how to fly, I, I won't even give them the controllers of a Phantom until they've gone through both of these drones, you know, in a one day period, I'm not going to like say, go home and I'll see you in two weeks. Um, but then that's just kind of instills that, look, these might look like toys, but really once you get muscle memory down and all that stuff, it really comes in to help, it really comes into hand, handy. Uh, so this is the, oh, it's not showing up as well as I thought. Is that, can you guys see that a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's a little small. Um, so yeah, this is the Phantom series that I was talking about. This, this is made by a company, DJI. Um, I'm going to be showing pretty much all DJI products. Uh, that's just a personal opinion of mine. Uh, there are other drone companies out there like 3DR and Unique. Um, but personally, I have stuck with the DJI um, series and I don't think I'm going to go to another series until something beats it. But at this point, especially with the Phantom 4 and the Inspire 1, I don't see any point of getting at any other ones. So there's a couple options you can get. The one on the far right is your most basic version of the Phantom 3. Uh, that's gonna cost you around $4.99. And basically it comes with a control alert, the camera, and the drone itself, obviously. It's based off of Wi-Fi, so all you need is your phone. And it connects, and that's how you see your FPV view of what you're filming, how you, how you go into the interface, how you put record, change all your ISO settings, your aperture. Everything is built into the app, which is great. And we'll see that whenever we uh, demo outside. If anyone can stick around, I'll go through kind of everything. And it's really amazing all the options you have just by using my iPad. So the next one over is the Phantom 3 Advanced uh, and the Pro Series. So there's, there's a, the Advanced can shoot up to 2K, and the, um, the Pro can shoot up to 4K. So that's really the only difference, and there's about a $200 difference price point. So the, the one that shoots 4K, uh, the Phantom 3 Pro is $1,000, um, and the Phantom 3 Advance is $799. But um, those can really pay for themselves within one job um, if, if, you know, if, if you can get that kind of client. Uh, it's really a small investment for the amount of money you can make with these kind of devices. Um, so the one on the far left, they just released this about, uh, it was like three weeks ago, I was in New York. Uh, for the launch event, and the Phantom 4 is literally, it, it, just, it just changes the entire way that people are going to start using these drones, because before it was guys like myself who, you know, would, would be video game nerds for 10 years and pick up the drone thing, and it just kind of came natural, uh, but you were doing everything manually. Like, you know, if you wanted to yaw left, you had to make it yaw left, and if you wanted to go forward, you had to go forward. Uh, if you didn't want to crash, you had to not crash it. 
Uh, the Phantom Four, I mean, from what I've seen so far, it's 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 almost too easy. It's gonna it's gonna put guys like me almost in a in a rough position because clients are gonna be like, oh yeah, just go with the Phantom Four. I'm, I have my nephew working for me now uh, for free, pretty much. Like, thanks anyways, but. Uh, yeah, the Phantom 4, I mean, it has obstacle avoidance, so if it's going towards, let's say, this wall back here, it has two sensors on the front uh, that can detect how far that is from the actual drone, and once it gets about four feet or three feet, it actually will stop on command. Um, anything between, like, not just that to be a wall, it could be that stair uh, set right there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. It also has a, a tracking feature, so you can literally look at the screen, uh, make a box, say, let's say that somebody's running on a field. You would make a box around that person and it would actively track them through your scene. Um, now, I don't have too many, too many um, examples of that being used because, like I said, it just came out. So literally, th probably the next week, you're going to start seeing guys that, that ordered them kind of doing real-life um, testing with it. Because when we go to these DJI events, you know, you see it in a perfect environment. It's going to work, of course. Uh, but really, I'm interested in seeing the real-life applications that people put it in. <coughs> So the, uh, the third option, or th my favorite option, I should say, is the Inspire series. So you're looking at the Inspire 1, and the camera that's on there is called the X5. Now this camera, this, this drone is my favorite because it's, it's just like the DJI Phantom series, where it has all those features that you can look on the, your iPad, you've got all the telemetry you need, uh, very easy to fly, in my opinion, GPS enabled. So uh, GPS means, we obviously know GPS means, but in a drone, uh, you get 12 satellites, and once you get 12 satellites, you can let the drone sit in the air, let go of the controllers, and with GPS coordinates, it will stay in that exact spot if you have it in GPS mode. Even if there's a gust of wind, it will know, I'm not supposed to leave this GPS spot. So it will counteract the wind, and it will stay right there. Now that's, that's great, and it's all good, but there are times where you will lose GPS, so that's where it's, I have to stress it again that the training uh, to know what, would, what you have to do when something like that happens, you go full manual and there's a gust of wind, you have to know exactly what the drone is pointing at, you have to know, okay, I counteract it by going to the left or I counteract it by going to the right, uh, because these things are not um, foolproof. I mean, th I mean they, they do have their errors. Uh, depending on where you're flying, you can get a lot of interference. Uh, if you're flying in a highly uh, urban area uh, with a bunch of buildings, you're gonna have tons of interference and you might not even get a GPS so you'll be flying manually and on a windy day that's it's very very tough um, but so this this drone has pretty much replaced um, it's kind of the, the the middle ground between the Phantom 3 and then your next bigger drone series which would be something like this, this is the Alta uh, but what's great about this one is you got a um, does anyone at the Movi is or the Ronin uh, three-axis gimbal that you can put a DSLR on basically it's essentially that but flying so this bundle here, you can see the price right there. I mean, that's out of my price range for now. And so I you know, get some bigger jobs, but that's $16,486.10, I'm just seeing. I don't know why it's 10 cents. Uh, but basically, that can hold a DSLR. So let's say that you, that you have a client that says, look, I need to shoot with the RED, or I need to shoot with you know, uh, the GH4 or uh, the Sony A7S II, and they're stuck on that, then you know, this is the option for you. Um, this, this is an amazing craft. You can actually put the drone on top of the, uh, you can put the camera on top of the drone for inspection. So for, and for um, bridge inspections, you can see that this camera, you know, you got all your axes here, but once you, you can only point up so far. Uh, so that in particular, you can put the drone on, uh, the camera on top, which is great. Um, but then back to the Inspire 1. So this is the reason why I chose the Inspire 1, because the Inspire 1, you can see that the camera on there is actually detachable. So this camera is not the original camera that came with the Inspire. The original camera was called the X3. It could shoot 4K, um, it, was, it was good, uh, but this one is pretty much like flying a GH4 in the air. You got 12 stops of dynamic range. Um, the 4K is, I think, true 4K, so when you, if you're shooting 1080p, if you're doing a 1080p project and you punch in on this 4K, you won't be able to tell. I think with the X3, you still get a little bit of comp compression. You know what I'm saying? Like if you, if you shoot 4K in hopes that in post I'll punch in, there's only certain 4K cameras you can do that with and actually get good results. But these results are, are fantastic. Um, so there's the one that I have is the middle one there, it's just the X5. The one on the right is actually the X5R. So obviously that means it can shoot raw DNG files. And I mean, that's, you're pretty much flying 
you know, a red at that point in my mind. Most of the clients that I, that I, that I work with are local clients um, that are just adding the drone shot to a project. Uh, they already have footage shot. They say, hey, let's get a drone out there. There are clients who I specifically just do drone shooting for. Uh, but most of my clients are guys who either hire me for the DP work and then I add on the drone stuff. So the camera in the middle to me is, is, is my option and my favorite option for sure. And what's the price point that I get? Yeah, so you know, you're looking at about $4,000 for that and that's just the, the drone. But like I said, I for a couple jobs, that itself could definitely pay for itself. Um, I do have the case over there and I have about eight batteries. So that's another thing to take in consideration. So these batteries, the flight time on these are about 15 minutes. So that's very important to know that and understand to your client, which I'll get into soon, that these can't stay up for you know, five hours, four hour flights. You know, they're, 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 they're 15 minute flights. So you have to really put the bird up there and know exactly what you're doing and get your shot and then come back down and change batteries or, or make sure that you're always aware of how much battery life you have because these are falling out of the sky. And like I said, I'm lucky that no, that hasn't happened to me, but I know guys that it'll say 90% uh, battery and then it'll just drop to 13% and that, that drone's coming down. Uh, so it's really, really important to know everything about even just the batteries. You have to know everything about the props. You have to know everything about the camera. It's not just as easy as it looks like when, when you buy this, it comes in a nice little box and you're like, oh, I got everything I need. But there's no manual in it. It's surprising. There's actually no manual in the Phantom series so you're supposed to know to download it, but then you, you just type in Phantom Crash in Living Room on YouTube, and you'll see the Christmas tree and everything, just the guy pulling the drone out, taking off, and you know, that's, that's it. It's, you just wasted you know, his, his Christmas present there. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, let's see. All right, so um, back to the cinematography side of things. So it's not just about getting the right movements in your shot and everything like that. It really starts with your uh, business management skills and your client interaction skills. Um, I've worked with so many clients, some, some I love clients, other clients you just, you just work with, uh, but that's the nature of the business. I mean, you're gonna have to work with pretty much every personality that you can imagine you'll be working with um, in this industry. Uh, that's a shout out to when I was an intern and I did iStock. Uh, searches, the cheesy people doing the handshake. Um, but yeah, I mean, so uh, talking to clients, especially with drones, is so important because there's such a new industry. It's not like these, it's not like the director himself has been a drone enthusiast like myself for the past two or three years. This guy is just like, oh, I saw this video and, and they were using a drone. Uh, we want to we wanna incorporate that into our shoot. Can you help us out here? Um, so really it starts with, well, <laughs> what would you like accomplished with this shot? Like, is it a landscape shot? Are you gonna have people involved? Asking all these questions is so important because you could be requested, hey, yeah, there's a St. Paddy's Day Parade and I wanna fly five feet above everybody and get this cool dramatic shot. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, so there's some guidelines that you have to go, you have to abide by. Um, so the FAA says that it's illegal to fly 400 feet and above. You can't fly over large crowds unless they're directly involved with your production. Um, you can't fly at night, uh, and you have to keep it in line of sight. So basically, that means you have to see the drone. And these drones can go dangerously far. I mean, I think I think this one itself can go about a mile. I have not taken it that far. I would, I'd be way too nervous to take it that far. I, I need I need to see the drone at all times. But these are things you have to bring up with a client, you know, because they don't know that this is something that you can't just, you know, take out in Center City and fly above, you know, hundreds of people. Uh, I have some center city shots in there, but you know it wasn't over a ton of people or anything like that. Um, so yeah, that's it starts with that, and then also figuring out what's the purpose of the shot. I mean, you, you guys are learning this. I mean, obviously, you probably already know this, but every shot should have a reason. You're not just going to put the drone up there because you know, oh, this would be cool to use it. I don't know how. I don't know. I don't know what the plan of the shot is, but let's actually just put it up there and see what we can get. Uh, it's not like that. We should be able to know. When I, like it goes back to the batteries because you have 15 minutes so per battery. I mean, eight batteries, I could, I could fly all day. Um, but explain to the client, like, look, once I put this drone up there, uh, we have to have everything lined up. Uh, we're only gonna have this amount of time um, and we have to have everything on point. It's not, we're not gonna go up there and the director is gonna be yelling at me because the drone is, sounds like a weed whacker up there. Like, hey, can you get this shot? You can get this shot, can you get this shot? Like, I'm just not gonna, I just don't work like that. Now there are times where it's a little more run and gun and of course, 
the director and I will do that at points. Like if we see something that's happening, we're like, oh, we got to get this. And of course, that that's um, that's natural to happen as well. Um, also, so some of the some of the clients I have are DPs themselves. So they just don't have a drone. So they've been they've been filming for longer than I have, editing for long I have uh, longer than I have. So they actually have a preference to control the actual camera movement. So that's when we get into dual operating controlling. So myself, I'm a single a single operator. So I pretty much Every shot that you see, I have full control over it. I don't hand my controller over to anybody. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. One is the price. Sometimes bringing on somebody else just to control the camera is a little expensive. But also, it's the communication that you need to have with somebody that you trust in this industry. You guys have to be on the same exact page. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a bunch of guys out there that I trust to do that. Um, but for the jobs that I'm currently doing, I just kind of say, you know what, client, I'm, client, I'm going to save you some money. It's a single operator. Um, you know, if you would like control, uh, we can discuss that. Um, but I, you know, check the reel out. Are you happy with what you see? That's how I did the single operator. It wasn't dual operator, that kind of thing. Now that doesn't, I don't want to say that dual operating is something you shouldn't do because some of the best stuff out there is dual operator because you just can't, sometimes you just can't get the smooth shots. You know, single, single operator looking up at the drone, looking at the screen and making sure your movements are exactly what you want because the way this drone works, is if you want the camera to move, you have to actually turn the drone. So, you know, you're turning the drone like this, and I'll go, I'll go more into this when we're outside. But, you know, you turn the drone like this, and now, you know, right is actually uh, forward, left is backwards, straight is left, back is right. I'm getting all confused already, actually. But, uh, yeah, so you have to always be aware of where the drone is pointing because uh, then your controls are all backwards. And when, when it turns around and it's looking at you, I mean, that's a whole other story. Everything else is just inverted. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things to consider with that. Um, they do have... <clears throat> so um, virtual reality in 2016 is probably going to be as big as drones are becoming. Real, well, FPV racing, I'll get into that. Um, so this is the Gear VR. Uh, this works with my Note 4. You slide your Note 4 in there and you got virtual reality 3D content. What's great about these devices though are they're starting to be implemented into drone use. So there's an app that you can actually download to your phone and put in um, a VR device like this, give it to the director, the director will get a live feed from your camera and all he has to do or she has to do is just move down, move up and the camera is following it wherever they look. So that, that's literally going to change filmmaking because it's no more of you know, getting a smooth tripod shot, rack focusing. Now it's just going to be like, all right, yep, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, yep. Like, so it's going to be really, really cool. Um, so this is just a small 360-degree uh, camera. Uh, they're starting to mount these on drones as well. Um, but the content for 360 videos and photos and using these devices this year is going to blow up. Um, so don't be surprised to start seeing these fly around um, on drones. On Facebook now, you probably have already seen it if you have a phone and there's a 360 degree video, you can just move your phone around. Um, but yeah, that's a whole other presentation. <laughs> Alright, so on location. Um, after you and your client have discussed exactly what they want, um, kind of what, what's going to be needed, um, you're going to actually be on location. So there's a bunch of things you have to do in preparation. You have to check the weather. You know, don't fly anything over, I'd say, about 20 miles per hour. You, this would probably have some issues with, and also you're losing a lot of battery. So I usually say, if it's under 25 miles, if it's under 20 miles per hour, I'll take the job, consider it. But if it comes to the day and it's just too windy or t it's raining or something like that, uh, in my contracts I have stuff saying that if we can't perform the shoot, we'll reschedule, all that kind of uh, stuff. Um, but yeah, so when you're on location, this is actually on Richard Branson's private island. I was lucky enough to film his tennis event there. Um, so the regulations there, I mean, he owns the island. I mean, there's, I don't know what, if no one's going to tell me to stop filming. Um, but this was cool because it was, there, was, there was a crowd, but I wasn't flying over the crowd. It was a tennis event. So we just took an afternoon um, to just set up a bunch of shots with two of the tennis pros. Uh, originally, we wanted actual live footage of the event. Um, but it was just one of those things that you have so many people there. Uh, when you put a drone up in the air, you're going to get a lot of people looking right at your drone. And there's nothing worse when you're filming and someone looks right at your camera and you're like, stop looking at me, stop looking at me, you're ruining the shot. So that happens a lot. Uh, so I like to have a controlled environment at all times. This was actually just during lunch. I just brought a couple of tennis pros out. Some of the footage was in my reel uh, that you guys saw earlier. Um, 
so yeah, so there, there was actually, to my left, we had a spotter that was actually just keeping an eye on the drone at all times. So you can see me with the controller there. Um, I'm, you know, I got the live feed. I also am looking at the drone itself. My spotter's sole responsibility is to keep an eye on that drone at all times. And that's very important because there will be times where I'll be looking down at the screen and I'll know the drone's okay, but I still have to just control everything um, you know, from, from the screen itself. Uh, another thing that I found out is actually helpful that the spotter does is called crowd control. Uh, so when I first started flying these drones, I would take it out of the park and, you know, I'd be flying the Phantom and I'd, I myself would be like, oh, this is awesome, this is awesome. And people would come up to me and I'd be like, oh, yeah, check this out, look at this, look at this. And just like, you know, just, just showing it off basically. But now, it, you can't, I, I don't do that at all. I, I tell my spotter, like, look, if someone approaches us, please explain to them that we're filming. I need full concentration. Uh, we will be more than happy to speak afterwards. But right now, while the, while the drone's up in the sky, you know, please, let's, you can watch, of course, but I'm not going to be answering any questions or anything like that. Uh, that's just something you pick up because there are times where you, or I would be talking with somebody, and it would just be in the park or anything, and, you know, I would, I would be explaining to them, and then I'd look up and be like, oh, where is it? Oh, oh there it is. But even just that slight of where is it moment could be, you know, there could be a tree or there could be a gust of wind you weren't expecting. And then, you know, you're buying another drone on Amazon. Um, yeah, so, the, I mean, I already talked about the client. If the client wants involved in just explaining to them, you know, this is how the dual operator works. Uh, is this something you're interested in? They don't even sometimes know what is involved with that. Um, but, yeah, just kind of if your client's on location, um, just being cordial, explain to them, you know, when the bird is up there, um, you know, we can, we can talk a little bit, but for the most part, let's make sure we have some kind of idea before we go up, uh, just so we're not yelling back and forth or there's not too much chaos when we're actually flying. Um, yeah. So post-production, I mean, this is, this isn't actually, yeah, I just took a screenshot of that. Um, so you got all these clips, like I said, this, this shoots in 4K, uh, 24P, 30 frames per second as well. Uh, you can do 1080p, I think, in 60 frames. Um, but getting, obviously, you guys know this as well, I'm preaching to the choir here, but before you even start a process or project, talk to your clients, what's your deliverable, uh, what do you want to shoot in, uh, where is this going to be broadcast, when is it going to be internet, is it going to be DVD, uh, hopefully a movie or a big screen, I don't know. Um, and finding that out first so you know what you're filming. Um, and then bringing these clips into post. The, um, the dynamic range, like I said, on this camera is 12 stops. Um, so you're getting a lot of lat long, uh, latitude or um, spacing, but a lot of color space. A lot of color space, so I shoot really, really flat. Uh, the settings on this camera are phenomenal for flat, for flat settings. That's why I'm so stuck on this drone that I'm not going to upgrade to the Alta like you saw. Uh, because, I mean, I, I'm so happy with these results that I don't think there need, there need to be any. Um, so it does have a three-axis gimbal on there. So. So I'll turn this on and you'll see the camera start to do a calibration. So basically what that's doing is, you know, it's finding its horizon line, it's making sure everything's level. Um, but also what's great about this is it's completely stabilized. It's not like, you know, it's a three axis motor, so it's constantly figuring out what's that horizon line. It's constantly fighting your drone movement to keep sure that you're level. So just basically, I mean, you can tell right there, that camera is not moving. It's just like a Movi, it's just like a Ronin. Um, I have the DJI Osmo as well, which is a handheld stabilizer that I shot that entire FPV video with. Um, that it's, I mean, it's, it's awesome, the technology, the three axis gimbal. But so that doesn't mean that when you're in post, you know, you're not gonna put a little bit of stabilization on there. So. Um, some of the shots, when you're up there flying, just it's so sensitive sometimes that if it catches the wind and it doesn't, you know, compute it fast enough, you will get a little bit of a, a movement. Um, so just putting, you know, a stabilizer on there sometimes helps. Um, also doing ramping effects, which you saw in my um, my reel, works out pretty well because the drone, you know, if if you're if you're going nice and smooth and you want your shot to be smooth, but just in post, you're like, you know what, I want to speed that up. I want that to just have a little more faster movement to it. You gotta be, make sure you're shooting in 60 frames. All that stuff can take into consideration. Um, yeah. So the, the fun stuff. So this is, so I've talked about cinematography. I've talked about the uses of drones, how to deal with clients, uh, what drones are out there. 
Um, this is actually 2016 is going to this is this is really blowing up actually, um, and I mention it because it's no longer just a hobby. I mean, the the, the drones. You can see this drone is completely different from that drone. I mean, this the drone over there is for cinematography purposes. This is purely a racing drone, hobby drone. It still has a camera on there. It's standard def, uh, but these things are going about 80 miles per hour, and you're seeing exactly what this drone sees because of the FPV camera and goggles that I wear. Uh, so this will be something. If you guys do want to stick around, I have a gate that we set up that we can fly through, and you guys can check it out in the goggles while I fly on the monitor. Um, but the reason that this is such a topic is because it's it's a drone. I mean, like, it's it's still relevant. It's it's all carbon fiber, but really, if you can see these prize pools, it's a little small, so I'll just read them out. Uh, last week, there was a race in Dubai called the World Prix, and the winner team, winning team took on $250,000, um, and the kid was 15 who was the pilot. So, like I said, it, it, comes from, it comes from people that were playing Halo forever and getting yelled at their parents like, this is never going to, you know, do anything for in life, and then, you know, this kid's sitting in a chair for $250,000 playing a video game, essentially. Um, even, I mean, even the second place got, what, is it 125000 And you, you were getting at least $12,500 if you placed eighth. So you pretty much had to qualify for the final race, and you're getting at least twelve grand. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, that's, this, is, this is the future for sure. This is the fun part. So a lot of this, I mean, this is, just, this is a tool. I don't want to say that this isn't fun to fly, but it's kind of like I will only fly this drone if it's for a job I'm getting paid or if I haven't had a job for a couple week or two and I, you know, I need to get just a little bit of skills going. I'll go to the park and fly it around. But I don't risk doing anything too crazy with that anymore. So this is where this comes in and kind of feeds the, the addiction, I guess. Uh, with racing this thing, uh, I can kind of let that sit home and only use that as a tool because essentially that's what it is. It's just a tool to use in your creative process. Uh, you know, it's not something that you pick a drone up and you're going to be the best drone operator in the world. It's not, it's not like that. Uh, it's just literally you still have to be a cinematographer, you still have to be an editor, you still have to be a director, you still have to do all these things. It's just like a slider that came out. When the sliders came out, a Steadicam came out. It's literally just another extension of your creativity. Um, but if you, if you still need speed, I mean, this is awesome.